Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department of the Colorado School of Mines. My name's Eric. And I'm Nicole. Okay, last time we developed an expression for thermal conductivity, and like many properties, we're to find today that it depends strongly on temperature. Recall that last time we developed an expression for thermal conductivity as one-third CVL, where C is our heat capacity, V is the group velocity of our phonons, and L is the mean free path between collisions. We'll look at the temperature dependence of each of these, and then at the end, bring it all together. So we've already spent a few videos on the temperature dependence of the heat capacity, so simply recall that it obeys the law of de Dalong Petit at high temperature, and drops to zero at low temperature. Now let's look at the group velocity. To first order, there's no temperature dependent, and it's just a constant. That makes sense. I think of the bonds between atoms as harmonic oscillators with a fixed spring constant. So I would expect temperature to change the amplitude of vibration, but not the underlying spring constant. Yeah, this is a really good assumption. When the group velocity does change significantly with temperature, it's actually so unusual that we have special terms. We say that the lattice is either stiffening or softening with temperature. Today, though, we'll assume it's a nice boring lattice where the group velocity is temperature independent. So that leaves us with the mean free path. Last time, we explored several sources of scattering, including boundaries, defects, and umklop scattering. And each scattering source has an associated mean free path. And we get the net mean free path through the sum over one over each of these mean free paths, L. Of these scattering sources, Nicole, which do you think contributes the most? Well, that would depend on temperature, right? Because at high temperatures, I would expect that there are so many phonons that umklop scattering is going to be the dominant contributor. And since this effect depends on phonon population, I'd expect L from umklop scattering to go roughly inversely with T. At low temperature, though, we really only see boundaries and defects and get a constant mean free path. Provided the boundaries and defect concentrations don't change much with temperature. Yeah, that's a good point. And we can plot the mean free path for each scattering source as well as the net mean free path as a function of temperature. So now that we have each piece, heat capacity, velocity, and mean free path, let's bring it all together into thermal conductivity as a function of temperature. This is all well and good, Eric, but how does this compare to real world materials? Yeah, so let's take a look at this figure. What you see here is that each material has a peak in thermal conductivity, just like we generally predicted from the scattering theory discussion above. Now what we've done though for the axes is normalize them. So we've normalized the temperature in terms of the temperature at which the thermal conductivity peaks, and we've normalized the magnitude of the thermal conductivity in terms of the magnitude of that peak point. So while it may seem that we've done a lot of hand waving in the last few videos, what we've done turns out to be a pretty decent approximation for reality, and really that's all that matters. And with that, looks like it's a good time for a recap. Uh, not quite. What do you mean? Well, I think this is a good time for a pop quiz on thermal conductivity in silicon. It would be a good way to get a solid grasp on thermal conductivity and how it relates to real materials. You ready? Sure. All right, I'll put up a figure for thermal conductivity of different types of silicon as a function of temperature. Why don't you walk me through it? Okay. I'm not exactly sure where to start. Why don't you start by telling me about the temperature dependence of each side of this curve? Well, on the left, there's a T cubed dependence, and that comes from our heat capacity because our mean free path is a constant at low temperature. Good, and how about the right side? Well, as the temperature starts to go up and up, our heat capacity becomes a constant, but our mean free path has an inverse relationship to temperature. Why? Umklop scattering, right? Exactly. All right, next question. Let's say we start with natural silicon and remove a bunch of the isotopes that are present at more trace quantities. Why do we see this rise in our thermal conductivity? So if we remove the isotopes, we have less impurities and therefore less defects. So we have an increased mean free path, which then increases kappa. But as we increase the temperature, umklop scattering really just takes over and both the natural and purified silicon converge together. But we see that the purified and natural silicon also have similar values for low temperature as well. Why is that? Uh, so at low temperatures, what wavelengths exist? Really long ones. Right. And if these low frequency waves encounter one SI29 impurity in this silicon, will they even react to it? No. 
Right, and it's not until we get about to 50 Kelvin that impurities start to act as a scattering source. Now, instead of having isotopic impurities, as we have in natural silicon, let's say we take silicon and dope it with aluminum or phosphorus. What then happens to our thermal conductivity? It should drop, because impurities are impurities, no matter what they are, and more scattering sources would decrease our net L, and thus kappa. Good, and we can say the same for the silicon germanium alloy, except in this case, the doping is about five orders of magnitude higher. Now let's look at nanowires which let's say have a diameter of 10 to 50 nanometers. Why is the thermal conductivity so low for them? Well, for the nanowire, the boundaries are closer together, and so we have more scattering. Good, and how about the nanograins? Well, we still have boundary scattering, but the boundaries are between the different grains, rather than between the material and the atmosphere. And the amorphous silicon is about as uncrystalline as you can get, which gives you a lot of scattering, and thus a really low kappa. Whew. All right, I think that about does it for this graph and wraps up thermal conductivity and phonons really nicely, with the exception of one question to ponder at home. At the bottom of this graph, there's a region where kappa has what we would call a minimum value. If you were going to develop an expression for minimum thermal conductivity, what would you put in it? Thanks for watching today's solid state physics in a nutshell. Next week, we'll be starting the electronic portion of the course, starting with the free electron model. See you then!